Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> oh, Lord. Yeah. Wait, I didn't catch How the, are you? I didn't catch with the back. Huh? What did it say on the oh, back? You know, we, you know, I gotta give I gotta give a Lord. huge shout out to, you know, you know, to the to the to the institution that made me, you okay. know, that kind of molded me, though that I was I was molded in the dark, you know. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So <laughs> how are you, Jolyn? How are you doing? Oh, you know, I'm great on this fine Tuesday. You know, I got my water, hydrated, yeah. highly moisturized. Yeah, you know. Elbows you are here too. super shiny. Coconut <laughs> oil on the skin, you know. <laughs> uh, this is some shea butter, so, you know. Okay, 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 all right. Well, all right, so you ready to get into it today? Because we got it. We got a pretty jam-packed episode, so. Per usual. Yeah. And it's a pretty legend. It's a pretty legendary day. Like you know, this week we're probably going to witness history. You know, for all the sports fans out there. But you know, that's for a whole nother other. You know, but I got a huge send a huge shout out to my guy LeBron James. We don't, you know, we haven't met yet, but you know, that's coming. Um, but yeah, so huge shout out to him because you know he's probably going to break one of the uh, biggest stat lines in history of the sport of basketball, which is the all time scoring. List, so I definitely have to give a huge shout out there. But that's not the reason why the people came today. That is not the reason why they are here. They are here today, Jolyn, because of the fact that they want some good old executive education. Okay. So without further ado, what's good, everybody? I'm Mark Monroe, accompanied by my wonderful co-host, co-producer, co-creator, and all things galactic. Give it up for none other than the wonderful. It's Jolyn GC in the place to be. What does it, cousins, on this fine Tuesday? And welcome to Executive Education, where, you know, it's the come up series where we give you a little bit of markets, we give you a little bit of investing, we give you a little bit of, you know, pretty soon financial advisement startups. But today in this show, we definitely keep it straight up educational, like always, which is giving you that master class in every single episode. So, uh, you know, Jolyn, I, I don't think that we should never change the formula because the formula works. So without further ado, if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below. And on top of that, hit the like button because we already know that this episode is going to be a banger. If you're new, welcome. Welcome. If you've been here for a while, if you're a cousin, you know, what, what's the shout out for them, uh, Jolene? What, what, what does it? Is it what I always say what does it, cousins. Back. All right. So now that I'm hydrated, I'm hype. I'm ready to go. We've already locked in the intro. So... Oh, yeah. Shout out to our cousins over there on the professional network of LinkedIn. We see y'all. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we know that you guys got busy schedules and everything else. But, you know, thank you just for making us your place to be on a Tuesday. So without further ado, Jolyn, you ready to get into this? Uh, you ready to get into this? Because we got a lot. It's a it's a you know, I'll, I'll start it off with this. How do you go from zero to one billion in four years? And if you can, you know. For the folks in the chat, you know, I want you to be able to tell us what company went from zero to four or to one billion dollars in four years. Put it in the chat. Put it in the chat. Put it in the chat. It's going to be interesting to see what everybody thinks and everything else. But yeah, it's going to be very huge. So today, if you haven't figured it out yet, uh, today is all about our wonderful business models. It's the thing that shapes molds and everything else as it pertains to economies, as well as businesses, because businesses make up the economy. And so we wanted to go through that because I feel like, you know, for those who have sat with me in the matrix before, you understand how I get down. And I felt like I would be remiss, especially in this is my final year and working together with Jolyn on a live capacity, weekly live capacity. Why not bring a little bit of that matrix energy here to uh, the come up series on a weekly episode. So in week six, we're going to definitely do breakdowns of uh, business models. So I'm ready to get it cracking. So wait. let's what? wait. Did they get it? Oh, uh, no. Shout out to, oh. I haven't checked yet. Shout out to Uncle Charles, who was the first. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What's good, Unc? We see you in the building. Hey, All good. right. So, but by the way, before we get started, we see a lot of folks that are out there. Um, yeah. that are posting up a lot of companies. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm singing. I'm well. I'm singing. Not not singing at all. Uh, I'm seeing. Let's see here. Tesla. Nope. Uh, Amazon. You actually got it. Whoever said Amazon, Who which was Amazon? 
Bet. I think it was Bet. Bet. Yep. Bet. Um, it was actually Amazon. So if you didn't know, Amazon was founded in 1994. And by the time when they went IPO, which was in 1997, they actually had amassed $1 billion in annual revenue. Now, this was like the beginning because it was like the fastest as it pertains to a company going to a billion dollars in annual revenue. So they did it in just four years and that's astounding as it pertains to what they were able to accomplish. And this really set the stage for a lot of companies that will later come down and follow. You probably have heard about some of those other companies that followed suit, like for example, a Facebook, a Google, and here's one that you probably didn't think about, Salesforce. Oh yeah. So yeah, there, there's that. So <laughs> somebody said I wasn't even born. That's not fair. Hey, you know, life is not fair, but you know. Wait, how young are y'all in this chat? <laughs> Good well, Lord. you know, it's going to be interesting to see exactly who wrote it because it was none other than our dear old friend Levick. So <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> all right. So let's get into it because, you know, like I said, it's going to be pretty jam packed. So, uh, let's run directly into it. Uh, so first things first, when we think about a business model, right? Mm -hmm. So a business model is pretty much like a blueprint that explains how a company makes money and operates. So literally, you know, if you ever like hear a person with an idea or anything like that, or if you ever like want to hear about a company, if you're ever talking about a company, it's always that question of, well, what's the business model? Like, yeah, how are like, you, you know, the idea, the idea is good, but what's the business model? <laughs> How do you make money? Yeah. All right. So since we're going to get into that, then let's go ahead and move over into presentation mode. Uh, so hopefully everybody can see it and we're ready to go. Um, yep. Yes. And you are correct. Stock was at 83 cents back in 1997. So let that sink in. All right. So, um, <laughs> so let's... I want. I felt like we should do it a little bit innovative today, you know, like change it up a little bit okay. and just show you guys exactly, you know, how we get down in our presentations. You know, we here at the Come Up Series, we like our presentations well-branded and everything else. So, you know, I feel like this is good, like as if we're giving a keynote speech for a new product release. And, you know, I feel like it's very fitting because when you see any type of product, it we many times when we see a product, we mm -hmm. tend to understand the business model when we see the product or service. So why not do it in this type of format? So let's, these are the things that we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about assessment of success or, or failure. Um, we're also going to talk about recognition of bad business models. Um, we're also going to talk about key performance indicators, a, also known as KPIs for a good business model. Um, and then being able to predict the future. So hang on to that one because this is going to be pretty, uh, pretty lit. All right. And then on top of that, we got discovering the core. So, and I'm going to leave you with a, you know, you're going to just want to take notes to it all, but let's just, you know, for those who are going to be listening in on Spotify and Apple music, let's go ahead and read it out for the folks. So when we think about uh, KPIs or key performance indicators, uh, so we identify K KPIs uh, for different types of companies, including tech base, retail, service base, and manufacturing. Those are really the key areas. So like, for example, if it's a retail business, nine times out of 10, it's some type of exchange for good as it pertains to money. When we think about including tech base or, or tech base, it could be uh, software as a service, platform as a service, so some type of subscription, or you pay for the services that are ultimately rendered. Uh, same thing as a service-based business. So for example, if you're getting your hair cut or you're going to the hair salon, getting your nails done or whatever it may be, or getting your yard done. Uh, and then on top of that manufacturing, you pay for the manufacturing of such a good, or you pay, for, you pay the manufacturer for the uh, to manufacture the product. Uh, so multiple different ways as it pertains to looking at multiple different business models. And then when we think about talking about the future uh, or predicting the future, we talk about factors that influence the development of future businesses. Uh, so for example, their business models, including technology, customer behavior, market trends, and competition. And we're going to get all into this, but I just wanted to make sure that you know we set the stage in the table of contents of executive education here today. And then we're going to be discovering the core business. So discussion on the bit of the benefits of discovering the core business model and how it can inform decision making for the future direction of the company. So like these are like mainstream things. So if you got your pen and paper, kudos to you. If you do not, if you do not know how we get down here at the come up series, this is like the free education that you wish that you had that you're actually getting. So the only thing that we ask of you guys to do 
is to make sure that you take copious notes <laughs> and feel free if you ask questions, you know, feel free to ask them. And if we have the time, then we'll make sure that we address them. We try to like think ahead where it's like essentially like the questions that you may already have. We probably have put them in the, in the presentation, but you know, you never know. One may slip. All right. So when we think about a business model, though, right, we think about it in many different components, right? So like if you look at this iPhone that sits in front of you, there's multiple components that ultimately make this iPhone go. So, for example, you think about, you know, the MagSafe charger that connects and, and also that magnet. Um, when we think about like the little elements in the middle, which is pretty much the, the storage as well as the processor unit. And then, of course, the battery. And then, of course, the, the main brace. And then, of course, you have the, uh, the camera sensor. So when you think about the business model, right, you think about it in some of those types of things. And like when we look at the pieces of like many times we focus on the one thing, which is the business model itself. But if you really get into the weeds of it, you start to break it up into pieces and you really start to see exactly how such a thing was formulated. So, you know, when we think about it, right, Jolyn, mm -hmm. what might be some of those components, do we think? Or should we give it to them in matrix format? Let's keep it matrix. Okay. We never experienced that, but yeah. <laughs> this is a That's good layout. Enough. So what we got, what do we have sitting in front of us? We got we key partnerships. Yes, we got, um, key, we got key partnerships. Key Go activities. Ahead. Okay. Key resources, uh, a value okay. proposition, which is uh, that's good that it's in the middle. Uh, customer mm -hmm. relationships, uh, different sales mm -hmm. channels, customer segments, cost structure, and we need to know what those revenue streams are. Yes. So it's actually interesting that you mentioned that because when we look at these things, right, it's like, you know, they're they're large for a reason. So anytime when you look at a startup and, and many times you're looking at a sheet that I actually use many times when I'm listening to a when I'm listening to a startup. Mm -hmm. or when I'm listening to a pitch. So for those out there that are wanting to like understand if you're a startup or if you're an entrepreneur, like make sure that you screenshot this or whatever it is that you need to do. Um, so that way you can remember this and then or just write it out so that way you have it as your own notes. And don't worry, we're going to go through these things uh, for sure um, to break it down for each and every single one of you. But I mean, there are certain key things that are major. Like, for example, in order for any business, no business ever just makes it successfully on its own. It takes you know, it, it takes more than just one person in order to make a business successful. So like, for example, key partnerships, who do you partner with? If we look at value proposition, what's in the value for, say, for example, the, the consumer or the client as it pertains to them doing business with you or buying your product? If we look at customer segments, you have multiple segments. You know, it's kind of like where we start talking about the chicken and the egg. You have a product or you have something to sell, but then also at the same token, who's your customer? Um, when we look at your relationship with the customer, like is your relationship solid or, you know, are there things in which that you're learning? What are your customer channels look like? So how do you access them? When we look at the key activities, what are the things that transpire? And don't get me, don't get me wrong. We're going to we're going to get into it. So um, so if we think about it. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's let's go through some of these, shall we? Yes. All right. So when we look at revenue streams, so, you know, it's pretty much, you know, a way that a company generates its income. I think that that one's fairly simple. Like the way that you can look at it. And here's the interesting thing also. I urge people to look at this as multifaceted. For the investor or the person that's looking to use this for stock market related uh, materials, this is huge for you understanding exactly how the business works, especially if you're going to be investing into it. You cannot invest in a business if you do not understand the components uh, that makes their business model. It just It's just not going to work. I mean, outside of just hearing what somebody else tells you and what their thesis is, this is huge as it pertains to being able to look at not only what the company currently is, but also who is it that they're going to be in the future. Remember that. Um, so then we look at something called cost structure, which is uh, the expenses a company incurs uh, to run its operations. Very simple, right? So what are the things in which it is going to cost in order for us to actually do business? When we look at the key resources, those are the resources the company needs to operate and deliver its value proposition. Um, so you can't have certain resources and be able to deliver those things. So if it's talent, it's talent. If it's you know the software, if it's the tech, if it's the patented idea, or if it's the product, you know whatever it is, those are the key resources. And so 
Again, I may actually post one on my social media so that way I can give you guys an example company of what that kind of looks like as it pertains to like what those components look like. Um, and then key activities. I mean, the activities the company must carry out to operate and deliver its value proposition. So, for example, I'll give you an, I'll give you an example company. Take, for example, Apple. Mm -hmm. You cannot have Apple's WWDC and their Apple launch events, especially when it comes to their iPhone, because they literally build the allure and everything else surrounding around those real, really those two events every single year in which that makes up the iPhone launch and then also unveiling the new software for their product that, that will literally uh, support their products. So the products are nothing without the software and then the products are also nothing without these major events that educate the consumers and businesses that are also consumers of its products uh, at those events. So that's the reason why we say key activities. There's also other things like, for example, holiday, like where they every year it's with, built into their business model strategy where they release something during the holiday, which is their number one top uh, item, but I don't want to go too far there. And then when we look at key partners, the companies or individuals that a company partners with to operate and deliver its value proposition. So for example, when you look at a lot of startups, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of startups out there, when you think about all the apps that you use, they're working with a key partner in order to essentially bring in their billing. How do we know this? Because if that was the case, every single startup out there would have to literally create their own billing system which can be significantly tedious and everything else. And if that was the case, there wouldn't be a Square, a Stripe, a PayPal, and all these other businesses, which if you start noticing, you start noticing that it's a core amount of companies that sit within a space. It's not overly saturated. And if it is overly saturated, it starts to become problems. So problems. again, having too many... Go ahead. I was going to say problems, but then that sounds like an opportunity for an acquisition. If there's mm -hmm. too many people offering the same value proposition... Yeah, you nailed it on the head. You nailed it on the head. Any company, like when you start seeing an oversaturated market, you can probably most likely assume that sooner or later that there's going to be acquisitions within that area and it never ceases to fail. All right. So then when we think about customer relationships to like kind of like nail it off. Right. So let's think about the relationships are the, so the customer relationships are the relationships with a company has with its customers. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, that's kind of like the, that's kind of like the lifeblood of every company. If you think about it, like look at Amazon, like where we just talked about how they got to $1 billion in revenue <laughs> that fast is because of the fact that one of the things that Jeff Bezos highly focused on was the customer experience which ultimately developed a certain level of trust from cust from Amazon customers, which allowed them to essentially flourish. And so that was huge as it pertains to the makeup of Amazon's uh, doing. So, so are you Jolene, saying that loyalty costs about a billion dollars? Hey, man, look, it's like, you know, we see it even in other things. Like if you look at brand loyalty or customer relationships, they're huge. I mean, think about like, let's even take Fortune 500 companies out of the process, right? Let's say that, you know, there's a restaurant that's within your neighborhood. If the restaurant has a bad relationship with its customer base within that area, how long do you think that that business is going to stay in business? It's not. Word of mouth, you know, and then once that <laughs> travels, no one's going, you know, let it let one person be mistreated. And especially now with social media, there's probably a TikTok on, you know, some bad business. But that reminds me of, you know, like a company, um, a fast food I, well, are they fast food or fast cash? Um, I feel all those those kind of restaurants in the same bucket, but like Chick-fil-A, how mm -hmm. you know every other sentence is my pleasure, my pleasure, my pleasure. It's like, okay, calm down. Hand me my food. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and you notice like if they mess up something, they go like the their customer service goes above and beyond to essentially to try to like, okay, how can we make this right? How can we make this order? Mm -hmm. Like you know, you even saw like on TikTok and Instagram at one point in time where they showed Chick-fil-A uh, like employees running just to make sure that the person got all the necessary things that there was in their order. So it just kind of like, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like that type of mentality. All right. So well, wait, Jalen, move on. Wait, I'm sorry. Question. Yeah. So with customer yeah. relationships. OK, so if that is if we've already seen the case studies and the case studies bear out, you know, actual uh, revenue, increase in profits, why don't more companies position themselves to have stronger customer um, relationships? 
Uh, that's a good question. And I think one of the interesting ones is like when we think about airlines, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're in such a, like, you have to think about it. Like, it's kind of like, in some cases, you could find yourself in a Tina situation where there is no other, where there is no alternative. Uh -huh. And when you find yourself in there is no alternative, though that you can go with like, if let's say that most folks that fly hate American Airlines and hate Delta. Like, let's say if there was a poll, but then everybody loves Delta. Even, that's kind of blasphemous. We can't even do that. You no, I'm saying, what if everybody loved Delta, but then at the same okay. in an example, okay. everybody loved Delta, but then everybody hated United Airlines and American Airlines. Mm -hmm. But, you know, let's just say that Delta doesn't have enough seats for that flight to get you there, but then you're going to, you still got to make it to your destination. Mm -hmm. So if Delta can't fly you there, are you going to walk? Are you going to take a road trip? Are you going to catch a train? <laughs> you know, right. or... Take it from another uh, example, and I'm actually glad that shout outs to cousin Andre, who who actually posted that in the chat. He said, uh, even though uh, their government <laughs> laugh out loud. <laughs> and it's kind of interesting that you put that there, because how many folks love the IRS? OK, all right. So <laughs> what you think about it, you have no other alternative. You have to work with the IRS. So it's kind of like those things where we where we look at it in perspective, where it's like if there is no alternative, you, no matter what the customer relationship is, you still got to do it. Now, in those particular cases, you know, nobody, anybody can catch smoke on at any point in time. But yet at the same token, some things are just going to be there for a very long time before the smoke even comes around. So who knows? I don't know if the IRS is going anywhere. I think that is going to definitely be around for quite some time. But it just goes to show you, like, you know, you know put it in, into perspective. All right. So, all right. So I'm thinking of a company, though, Jolyn, that, you know, we can kind of, like, put into, into the foray. And I'm going to ask Butter to lay down. Thank you, sir. So what do you think about, uh, what do you, you know, what, what would you say is NVIDIA's business model, Jolyn? Like, you know. Oh, gosh. NVIDIA's business model? Um, yeah. Well, well, first of all, they're a technology company, one that it's is true. heavily supported by you. They specialize in uh, graphics, um, like that graphics card that you always show, or oh, similar to mm -hmm. this one that's on screen right now. Um, yes. but also have I actually heavy... have that graphics card. <laughs> oh, you do? Okay. They also have yeah. a heavy um, lead, I would say, in artificial intelligence. That is true. That is true. So, yeah. So, to think about it, though, right? It's like... But what's the, what would you, well, we'll get into that a little bit, but let's just, let's just ask one question. What okay. do you think, where do you think NVIDIA started? Where did they start? Oh, you know, I don't know the history of NVIDIA. So if I had to guess, I would guess that NVIDIA definitely did not start in graphics cards. I think that mm. they may have worked their way to that um, based on like market demand and like where the industry was uh, heading. Actually, they did start in graphics cards. What? You second guess oh. yourself. <laughs> well, they yeah, yes. right off the gate. Yeah, they started. So <laughs> NVIDIA has always started in graphics cards. And then mm -hmm. they got into AI when they started realizing, oh, man, this is creating a whole new market for us because we realize exactly how powerful our graphics cards are in mm -hmm. comparison to like other chips like CPUs and stuff like that. Like to put it into perspective, like an NVIDIA graphics card chip is like 10 times more powerful than your base CPU chip. So when they put that into mindset and they were like, okay, well, just imagine what happens if you gave something that is 10 times more powerful than a simple CPU. Mm -hmm. And then you put that towards like data centers or artificial intelligence. Oof, my God, the processing power, the computing power. Because it's already built to like, you know, process, you know, large, high quality images within a matter of speed. And if you can do that, but yet it's at the same token, bring it into the world of data, then you're running even faster. And that's what led from one from one graphics card chip literally spawned an entire industry. But I'm getting a little bit too far ahead of myself. I don't want to get too far ahead, but, you know, pretty much they, they generate their revenue through the sale of its GPUs and AI platforms, as well as uh, the licensing fees for the patented technologies as well. So there's that as there's also that. 
So let's look at something called uh, the evaluation criteria, right? Because, okay, so let's say that we understand like the the components of a business model. We understand exactly, you know, what a business model is. So how do you evaluate it, right? You know, how does this work? So the way that we evaluate it is, you know, there's a good quote that, you know, I, from one of my favorite shows back when Mr. Bobby Axelrod was on the show, uh, Billions, mm-hmm. it's not an endorsement, um, <laughs> but <laughs> there was a line in there that says, you don't have to outswim the shark. You just have to outswim the guy you're scuba diving with. Which is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> very much so. And very savage. <laughs> It is. It is very much so savage because now we start to look at the things like, for example, where we start to get into the competitive landscape. So, Mm -hmm. for example, if we look at, you know, like, let's run it back to AMD, like to NVIDIA and AMD or Intel, right? Well, if NVIDIA's chips are 10 times more powerful than the CPU, you know, that meant that like, you know, Intel had to jump into the graphics card space in order to actually really be able to step in to compete against an NVIDIA and show enough, what did they do? They created a graphics card. Is it trash right now? You betcha. But yet at the same token, it's just the first iteration. And only when we think about iterations, things get better over time. But again, you know, they stepped into a new space because they saw that there was opportunity there. And here's the reason why. I'll break it down to you when you look at it from a competition perspective, Mm -hmm. just based upon these three things, financial performance, customer satisfaction, and market share. Those are the three things that when we look at, like, even when we start comparing companies, those are the three things that we look at across the board. Okay. No matter what, we look at financial performance, customer satisfaction, and market share. Let me break it down for you. So financial performance, it's all about revenue, profit, and cash flow. I mean, you know, if, ands, or buts about it. If you want to, you can also do, like, for example, decree, like, you know, expen- operating expenses, as it pertains to, you know, you know, where, what are we looking at? But I mean, that's typically the three, the Trinity, revenue, profit, and cash flow. Without those three things, you're dead. There's no, there's nothing left to talk about. All right. So then we start thinking about something called customer satisfaction. What do the customers feel about the company? And we typically learn these things, like, for example, within surveying, tracking behavior, and analyzing feedback. So when we say by surveying, it's like, of course, they're always asking as it pertains to quality assurance uh, or not even quality assurance, but just asking the customer base. So hence the reason why you see a lot of tech YouTubers out there that review the products. They are really the pulse of a lot of these products that come out, which a lot of these companies heavily rely on a lot of these tech YouTubers or tech reviewers to literally give their thoughts and opinion. And they listen to those opinions if they're good or if they're smart to ultimately increase product. And then of course they look at the broad base to see exactly how that works. So you go from surveying a small subset group, which is, you know, which has a large mass amount of following. And then of course you track the behavior, whether it's through the sales of revenue, profit and cash flow, as well as uh, use uh, rev- product reviews and all that other stuff. And then you analyze that feedback to learn, okay, hey, what were the pros and the cons as it pertains to what is it that we just provided to our customer base? And then, which leads us into this other thing called market share. So, for example, are you drowning or are you flying? I I tend to say this to, you know, pretty much a lot of startups. (laughs) Like, you know, what is your goal here? Are you looking to drown or are you looking to fly? Now, what does that mean? So, if we're saying, you know, tracking uh, market trends. So, sorry for the misspelling there. We kind of typed it a little fast. But uh, tracking market trends and then competition and customer behavior. You're consistently tracking those things. So for Mm -hmm. example, you know, what are the trends? What are we starting to show from that, from that, uh, from that uh, user behavior or from that customer behavior and analyzing the feedback of what we've got, you know, are we starting to see a global trend as it pertains to people wanting more of this? I'll give you an example. Remember back when iPhone was literally consistently like the smallest device on the market? Mm-hmm. And then Samsung came out with a bigger is better campaign where they started to increase the screen size. And then we started noticing that a lot of folks were essentially buying larger phones. And it really kind of like if Apple didn't make that pivot to pay attention to their customer base, that Apple would be a completely different company today, a completely different company. So they paid attention. They tracked their they tracked the market trends, which was saying that the market like the, the their customer base within the market wanted larger phones. 
they wanted to see more on the screen. They wanted to do more on their screens. So they were tracking the customer behavior. And then on top of that, they started tracking what their competition was doing. And then show enough, the iPhone Plus was born. <laughs> bigger, larger phone. But also that's interesting too, because when you think about it, like you just said, if they didn't do it, they would have lost significant um, market share. Mm -hmm. But then also just the capabilities of the phones are starting to change. Like as it became more so, you know, closely aligned to a, a PC in your hand, then you it would make sense that you would need a larger screen so that you can, you know, enjoy all of the benefits. Yep. Including software and apps later on. Yep. All right. So when we think about that, like let's let's come back to our, our good old presentation here. And let's look at the next thing, which is, you know, so we just went through all that, right? Now let's examine, you know, how to recognize bad business models. <laughs> now, just because they're <laughs> hold on. So sometimes a bad business model can be spurred by evolution of the product uh, or the evolution of the customer. And maybe you weren't paying attention or just the sign of the times. Economic times change tend to create opportunities within the market space. And when they create opportunities within the marketplace, they also sometimes close doors to other places. Hence the reason why we had that episode way back, maybe a few weeks ago, where we talked about digital leadership, where you're able to pay attention to those things and you track those. So that way, essentially, you, if there's time for you to make a pivot, which means that you need to make a significant change within the product or the service or the, or the business, you're going to make that change. So when we think about recognizing bad business models, you know, this is about building that muscle memory and strength to recognize bad business models. Uh, helps you as an investor and entrepreneur and professional. So just remember that, like, you know, if you don't remember anything else when it comes to bad business models, it's about recognizing the things in which that help you as an investor, entrepreneur and professional. So these are going to help you across the entire board. So if you're at a company, you know, if you work at a Fortune 500 company, you can kind of sometimes see the writing on the wall when it comes to like examining what's happening at the company. So when you do you read your company's uh, quarterly reports? Do you see what's happening? If you are looking at like, say, for example, the, the amounts of recruiting are people like literally like knocking or beating down the door of the company that you work for to come work there? Or are you starting to see that there's a decline in interest? Are we starting to see, say, for example, the things as it pertains to like, you know, low ROI and you're starting to notice that managers are starting to count the beans a little bit more. So when they become bean counters and that lets you know that things get tight. So here are the three things to look at when we say, all right, uh, these are declining uh, or these are bad business models. One, a low ROI. So AKA low return on investment. But you know what? I shouldn't have to tell you all this. You know what, JoLynn? Let me take a water break and you take the show. Go for it. What? I was just about to take, let me take a sip first. Okay. So um, you said the three, but also getting back to what we were talking about earlier, um, I would also add poor customer relations. Um, mm. That should definitely yes. be added onto uh, one of these. But if we're looking at the, these three as, you know, like the main, main vein, then um, the decreased revenue when you're consistently losing money, like that's something that definitely can be tracked. You know, like that's not something mm. that would be a surprise. Um well, I mean, it could be a surprise if you're not paying attention. And then what's the the part about the declining market share? This always reminds me of Intel. I'm not saying that their business model is bad, but I am saying that they are fighting, um, you know, to maintain that market share when you have companies like AMD and NVIDIA, you know, all like P. Diddy, all up in the videos, like they're the ones that are taking <laughs> you know so there's um there's that that we get to you know look at but if we're going to talk about an example of a poor business model okay i gave a half one intel but we all we have to do is look at companies that are no longer here like mm. the reason why they're no longer here is because something went wrong with either these things either there was decreased revenue they lost market share um or they had a low um, return on investment 
or, you know, poor customer service. So we talked about Blockbuster last, um, was that last week or was that two weeks ago? Yes, it was. It, it, well, it was one of them. <laughs> it felt like it felt like last week. So we'll just say it was last week. So Blockbuster, um, that was a result of declining market share, but then also innovation. You look at those S curves, Blockbuster could not innovate fast enough. And um, when you can't innovate fast enough, then that's an indication that your whole company, your business plan is complacent. Complacency is the death of business. Like you want to be able to um, analyze the trends, customer feedback, data, all those things. But even if they did that, Mark, yeah. because the technology, the innovation, the S curve was moving towards something completely different. And that which that was first, it started as moving away from the business model of going into a brick and mortar to, you know, remember we talked about our Friday nights at uh, Blockbuster to now you can just have a queue and you get these DVDs or whatever in the mail and you don't have to go anywhere and think about the convenience of just dropping it off in your mailbox. You got to check your mail anyway. So now you have another added surprise when you go to your mailbox. Oh, there's a little red envelope. I remember those red envelopes, uh, especially in law school. You know, I was like, oh yeah, I got to get my cue when the break comes. Like I'm taking a break. I'm going to watch all these movies. And then what did Netflix do? They pivoted and switched up the game again. Now it's streaming. Now <laughs> there's no paper envelopes anymore. And so what is is there like still at least one blockbuster or a Hollywood video? Isn't there like one? They say that there is. Well, we have a Hollywood video out here in Auburn. You know, shout outs to you know Auburn. Uh, but... Oh my god! <laughs> but the funny thing is, first of all, Mark, I don't know about you, but I don't even have a DVD player. I don't like, either. Like I got rid of it. I don't. I don't have it. Like I think I had one in college, and then that was it for me. Well, I definitely I had one in law school for sure because you know, the little red envelopes, but yeah. So that's a, an example of the decreased uh, market share or declining market share. But like, what would you say is one for um, the low R R O I? Like which one, what company? Oh, well, you easily you can look at Snapchat. Like, oh. <laughs> I mean, if we want to look no further, you know, a company that spends a lot of money and then it doesn't like literally come to fruition. Mm -hmm. And it was so expensive to build. And now it's like you're sitting there with a lot of expenses. So when more expenses take away from the revenue that you take in, then that means that that's a low return on investment. That's a low return on investment. Then now to an investor or to anybody else, why would you want to like literally be there? Like, or why would you want to be invested in such a company? So where Snapchat once upon a time was tooted as like the, the ultimate competitor Mm -hmm. to you know instagram and then well <laughs> let's roll back the tape to that one before that show got canceled um and so i think the thing is for snapchat is they're unable to generate significant amounts of positive cash flow i mean if they and it's like and that's a major problem for snapchat and i think that honestly they're either caught with economic times or it mm -hmm. could be a sign that's showing you that again they're not able to monetize as much. Like they're they're definitely getting revenue. Like it doesn't mean that they're not getting revenue, but are they making enough revenue to be able to tell either investors, professionals that either want to go work there, or just folks that want to also build on top of their core platform and what mm -hmm. they provide? You know, is that something that you want to be a part of? Someone had asked, can you say that the same thing for Meta? No, you, you can't. Think, no, you can't. Not yet. <laughs> Not no, yet. you can't. <laughs> I, I don't think that we're going to see it anytime soon for Meta. You well, know, I heard a lot of really folks saying that they're dead. They're dying. But you have to think about it. Like, you know, a lot of folks only pay attention to Meta, the social media side, mm -hmm. like the Instagram and Facebook. But then they don't pay attention to the WhatsApp, the, the Oculus division and the AI side as it pertains to what they provide. You know, there's a lot there that's cooking underneath the hood that also can power the business to open up other verticals. And as you saw from their most recent earnings, I mean, they're doing okay. They're doing just fine. Um, some facts from Uncle Charles. Uncle Charles says that the last blockbuster is located in Bend, Oregon, so right down the street. And then also <laughs> another company that um, that kind of like went to the wayside because they did not innovate fast enough was Kodak, which is what Uncle Charles yes. Um, just mentioned. So mm -hmm. 
there's so many examples of these <laughs> bad companies, bad business models. So your research and your notes should be pretty thick. And a lot of times people are going to turn to like, you know, like, for example, somebody had asked a question. Mm -hmm. But what if you're innov what if, what if you're innovating, but you're too far for, for too far ahead of the curve? Well, the market's not ready for you yet. Like for example, the market is not ready, so you haven't really discovered that product market fit yet. It's just the thing is, is that you know, and I'll get to it. That's the reason why we look at the core business model. Like the, everything that you see outside of that builds on top of the core business model. But we'll, I don't want to get too far ahead. Okay. But this will actually like literally help provide a lot of color towards what we're looking at next, okay. which is the, the indicators. So like, for example, where we have indicators for, um, where we have indicators for looking at a chart, mm -hmm. we have indicators looking at it as it pertains to a relationship that you need to look, get out of. <laughs> we also have key performance indicators for a good business model. Uh, and if they don't, and if they don't meet the criteria of this, then it also can kind of like point to you to let you know that you have a bad business model. Um, but you know, let's look at some of them, shall we? So let's look at like one of them, which is revenue growth. Now, a lot of times people don't really pay attention to revenue growth. They only just pay, pay attention to this is the revenue that came in, but they don't look at the revenue growth over quarter, over quarter, over year, over year. They don't do that, which is very much so unfortunate, but it pretty much measures the growth of a company's revenue over a period of time. So let's just take a simple example, shall we? So if a company's revenue was $100,000 in 2019, and then let's say that they brought in $120,000 in 2020, then the revenue growth was 20%, right? So, you know, and then on top of that, it's like, if, if you look at it, we look at the next thing, which is the gross profit. And this is where it's like, you know, where we look at companies like Tesla. Mm -hmm. So this is why Tesla stands out amongst all the other auto manufacturers within its within its category or just across the board is because it measures the profit a company makes after subtracting the cost of the goods sold. So that's the reason why, like, if you look at most of your auto manufacturers, they're, you know, they're probably either in the single digits of teens. Meanwhile, Tesla's profit margin is probably around, what is it? Uh, I'd probably say 28%, almost 30%. So again, and the other company that's the most glorified as it pertains to having some of the best profit margins, mm -hmm. of course, is the most valuable company uh, in the U.S. stock market, which is Apple, you know, their best their best item that they sell is their iPhone. Now, of course, their other items are also just as great, but yet at the same token, it's like, OK, you know, here it is. All right. So then you were talking about something, uh, Jolene, about customer satisfaction. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's actually a KPI for that called uh, customer satisfaction rate, which measures how satisfied customers are with the company's products or services. So, you know, where we were talking about like tracking trends, tracking customer behavior, you know, listening, analyzing the data and analyzing, you know, what you're hearing, analyzing the reviews. That's really where it comes into play, which later leads into if customer satisfaction rate, then you also have to look at customer retention rate, which measures the which measures the percentage of customers that continue to use a company's provide uh, their products or services. It's the so the more that you're able to retain, it's like, exactly. If the business is sticky, then ultimately that, that's a good thing. And investors, we love that. Investors love it. Entrepreneurs, if you're listening, you definitely want to look at it as it pertains to, is your business sticky? If your business is not sticky, then what's to say that, okay, hey, a person buys a product or service from you today, they pay you for it. But then next thing you know, they see something else that's you know more shiny. Then they mm -hmm. literally just jump ship. And then they're off to the they're off to the next, which turns into the other part, which is lifetime customer value, which measures the total amount of money a customer is expected to spend with a company over time. And trust and believe, you know, companies like Apple and everybody else, they definitely look into this uh, on a consistent basis to kind of like use this as a projection for future mm -hmm. growth or for Mark. future earnings. Mark, yes. so let me ask you this. So um, with um what was it? Hold on. I just lost my train of thought. Oh, with the the customer retention rate and the stickiness, yep. right? Um, yep. So when we look at that, um, you know, creating the ecosystem is really important. But as a startup, yep. you know, there's always the focus on the MVP and like mm -hmm. keeping the main thing, the main thing and only focusing on one. But when you can kind of project out like, OK, here's the main thing that we're working on. And this is where we see the next iteration for the ecosystem. You can build out that vision. 
I feel like uh -huh. that's a good way to get investors on board and enroll those investors in your longer term vision, even though you got to focus on that MVP first. It's true. I mean, you see that happening with a company like Meta. They've invested tons, tons of capital towards the metaverse, mm -hmm. though that their core business is really towards their social media platforms and communication. Though that this one can make the argument and say that the metaverse ultimately builds on top of it. But yet at the same token, it's like, you know, they're slightly they, they have some significant differences between the two because there are significant changes in the course of technology as we know it. Um, so let's go back to that if we can, um, which is looking at like, for example, here's one that I'm probably sure that a lot of folks don't know, which is net promoter score, AKA NPS. And it measures how likely customers are to recommend a company's products or services, uh, to others. And we seen, and here's the interesting thing, you know, a lot of tech companies got smart on this and they started using this as a metric to actually use it towards their advertisement model. So really, if you think about it, like, you know, how Twitter and uh, Facebook really made their platforms even more stickier, mm -hmm. they actually use these things to literally like, like when people started talking about specific subjects, they built advertisement models and customer segmentations and demographics around it. So that way they can literally turn to advertising businesses or whomever else that was trying to advertise. So let's just say, like, for example, if we're having the conversation, is Michael Jordan the GOAT or is LeBron James the GOAT? Like it's the debate that's been happening for for a while now, right? Just kidding. Mm -hmm. the, <laughs> right. So, but if you think about it, you know, you know, think about how much like these platforms have monetized off of that discussion. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, you know, where a lot of folks may throw a certain uh, point in the argument, you know, towards like, for example, Michael Jordan's shoes that have like lasted for a lifetime and everybody still buys them. Um, what do you think happens that turns into a model for, let's say, a Nike to advertise in that area and also company like those same social media companies will ex will keep that conversation going by keep throwing you and keep feeding you that type of programming of those types of dialogues and conversation. You see the same thing happen on YouTube platforms as well as TikTok. They're pretty much feeding you. What is it that you talk about or mm -hmm. what is it that you or that you listen to? And they just that... keep feeding you and feeding you and feeding you. So how does that work with um you know, so say like you're watching a popular show, like a reality yep. TV show, trash TV, whatever, yep. you know, guilty pleasures, vices, all that. Yeah, sure. And then, you know, you go to Twitter afterwards because that's a whole yep. nother part. That's like a part of the show experience now. Um, how would yep. companies take advantage of? Um, they of would that? find other people. They would find other people that are talking in the conversation, people whom which that you don't follow, but finding their second degree of second separation. Mm -hmm. To literally put it in your feed so that way you may stumble upon it. Mm. <laughs> or put yeah. like, say, for example, the content of maybe the next reality TV or, you know, whatever it is that you watch and they will put it in your feed so that way you're watching it. It's pretty much part of that same NPS. But so for, like to keep more, it simple for everybody. Go ahead. I was going to say, is it kind of like, you know, more like something else you might enjoy? Like when you're... Um, mm -hmm. On Amazon, or I mean, you've seen it. You've seen it happen, like exactly when you talk about certain things, and then next thing you know, it shows up on your Amazon in your Amazon search, or just when you're browsing, you're like, "Wait a minute, how did Amazon know that?" They're listening. <laughs> <laughs> so, business. <laughs> so let's let's bring it back into the business model uh, standpoint, though. Though that I just introduced a whole another business model to everybody else, but you know, if you think about it, like let's take it for example where. If 100 customers were surveyed and 60 of them said that they would highly recommend a company's products or services to like the other net promoters, so then uh, to other people, then the net promoter score would be a 60. Mm -hmm. So it's a 60%. Okay. Kind of crazy, right? Mm -hmm. So then we get to other things like, for example, operating margin and all those other things that everybody knows about. Uh, you know, pretty much the basic parts, which, you know, like I said, if you have all those things, they kind of like fall in line. And one of the interesting things that I noticed about key performance indicators from a very early time to now mm -hmm. is that if a company is doing all the right things, then all the key performance indicators kind of like succinctly line up together. And it's like, it, it's pretty much a, a solid chain. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, like you can either say it's a solid chain that surrounds you, or it's like, that's a sign that you've just established a moat. So, yeah. Mm, say that part that's again. Fun. 
So when you see like, for example, revenue, revenue growth turns into like means that gross profit margins are good and gross profit margins are built from customers uh, building strong customer satisfaction rates and customer satisfaction rates that are high equal good customer retention rates, which creates stickiness. And then ultimately from that stickiness creates long term customer value. And then based upon that long lifetime customer value, then that creates a net promoter score, because nine times out of 10, if they're a lifetime customer, then they're going to talk to you. They're going to talk to other people which ultimately increases that number. And if it increases that number, then it increases your sales conversion rate. And then your average order uh, value also starts to increase, which is the average amount of money a customer spends per order. And then after that, you also start to see this other thing called the operating margin, like which measures the profit a company makes after subtracting expenses. You start to see operating margin increase, which AKA increases return on investment. You see how I did that there? See? Yes, I see how you did that. <laughs> all right <laughs> all right so then let's get a little bit technical though because there's this thing called the hamel four which we also use to look at business models um it's a lot so i'm going to just simply just read what's on the screen and then if you if you want me to jolene i can do a quick breakdown but just for the folks in whom wish that are listening via podcast here's the hamel four it's an overview of four kpis developed by a guy by the name of gary hamel who was a leading management consultant and author so if you want to check him out go for it um, but I'll break it down for you just to keep it simple for everybody. This is used for evaluating the success or failure of a business model. So what do we look at? We look at market impact, uh, a bit, you know, the, the level of impact a company or business has on the market, including its market share, customer satisfaction, and level of innovation. Uh, so we typically see this in like tech companies, but we also see it across other sectors, like for example, finance and uh, uh, industrial. Uh, you don't really see it in like consumer staples, but you could. Uh, but then we also have customer intimacy. Now, a lot of folks don't really know about this thing, but it's the level of intimacy a business has with its customers, in, including their level of satisfaction. Now, here's the interesting thing that we just talked about, right? Yeah. If you notice, if you look at the Hamel 4, you can kind of like start to see that things start to align where you're starting to see where certain pieces in this, in the, in, in the KPIs, mm -hmm. literally start to form the Hamel 4. So just for perspective for everybody. Nice. So... So that's like satisfaction, loyalty, and retention. And then we look at operational excellence. This is the level of operational uh, excellence a business has, including its efficiency, productivity, and ability to scale. So growth and scale. Um, and then when we think about the financial performance, I mean, it's the measurement of the financial uh, of the business, including revenue, profits, and cash flow. Like I said before, those are the three things, the holy trinity, revenue, profits, and cash flow. All right. So... Let's get into the real how, though, which breaks it into three things. I, I kind of like put it to it's for y'all here. So which will lead us into some of the things, um, which is, you know, monitor industry trends. So this is like, you know, how is it that you're able to predict, by the way? So okay. if people are like asking us like, well, Mark, how do you predict, you know, a, a future business model? This is how you're going to do it. So if you stayed with us long enough in this conversation, then this is where it's going to really get interesting. This is how I see ahead, like, you know, three, five, seven, ten years ahead. This is exactly how I do it. I look at them. I monitor industry trends. So the companies need to stay ahead of the industry trends in order to stay competitive. I mean, I think that that's that's fairly simple. Right. So what is it that the company is doing in order to do that? I'm looking for that type of behavior. I'm looking for those types of elements. What are they spending in R&D? What are they working on in R&D? You know, those are the things in which I definitely pay attention to. And then I also look at, you know, anticipating the customer needs. So we're all customers. We all we can all find ourselves and look at ourselves as customers and understand based upon what this company provides, based upon what we can kind of see co coming down the pipeline in the future, we can kind of get an, antip an anti uh, anticipation hit on what our needs are going to be and then looking at whether or not the company is going to be able to solve them and if they're paying attention. So do you understand your customers and anticipate their needs? If you can't, then that's not going to be a recipe for your success in the future at all. And then, of course, identify disruptive tech. So you must be able to identify disruptive technologies that can impact your business model. And so the companies that do it well, well, they're still standing. The companies that don't do it well, well they're not here. They're probably in the graveyard somewhere or in the, the scrapyard where somebody's like, you know, picking off like, you know, little bits and pieces. But, you know, what do we see typically take place? I mean, I'm going to send you guys with a piece of homework. And so that way you guys can remember this. Mm -hmm. Take your favorite company. Most likely it's going to be a tech company. But take your favorite company and ask yourself, 
how many acquisitions have they made in the past five years? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> how many acquisitions have they made in the past five years? Mm. If they're making acquisitions, they're probably recognizing that, ooh, look here, Tom, that company could be a problem. <laughs> We need to do something about this. Mm -hmm. And so again, when we look at predicting, right, it allows a company to stay ahead of its competitors and adapt to changing market trends. All right. So when we look at the technological advancements, you know, these are changes in customer behavior, market trends and competition are all factors that can impact. When we think about the process of predicting, you know, the future uh, for the business model, we you know, this includes analyzing current market trends like we had discussed. This includes, you know, the customer behavior and technological advancements, as well as conducting scenario planning and competitor analysis. Yes. So, for example, don't think that if you step out there with a business product or with a business service, that somebody that is your competitor, they're not paying attention to you. Mm. Like, at, like the moment that you like, think about it like this. You're going to a dance or you're going to a party that night. And let's just say that you, you know, you know that you are looking at who else is walking in the room. <laughs> people tend to size up other people who come into the room fairly quickly to recognize this person could be a friend, this person can be a foe, this person could be a problem. There, everybody is watching. So, for example, when you see like those TechCrunch articles that come out of startups. When you hear about like a company that's publicly traded that like releases a new product, like for example, when Apple releases this product this year as it pertains to its headset, don't think that other people are not going to be paying attention. The partners, the potential uh, partners are going to be paying attention, like for example, the development community to see exactly what they have and to make a decision of whether or not they go team meta or they go with team Apple or work with both. Um. And then on top of that, the competitor meta is definitely going to be watching from across the room mm -hmm. <laughs> saying like, okay, what are we doing here? What do you have? You know, it's, it's simple. Um, and so when we, we also look at other things, like for example, the importance of being flexible and agile, you know, a lot of tech companies are this, a lot of startups are this way, you know, as you get larger, it's a little bit harder. But if you notice something, a lot of companies that are large base companies, we're talking about like your Fortune 500 companies, notice what's changing within their corporations, uh, within their corporate structure. So like HR used to be this one centralized hub across all of the business. Mm -hmm. Now they're dissected where each HR is like its own small silo where they represent smaller parts of the business. So, for example, you'll have HR for, if it's Amazon, you'll have HR for Amazon.com, and then HR for AWS, and then HR for logistics, those types of things. They, they may know of each other, <laughs> but look, we're with Team AWS, y'all with Amazon.com, <laughs> y'all down the hall. All right, so it's, it's that type of mentality, as well as being able to, uh, and being able and willing to pivot and change direction if necessary, like you had said, Joanne. So companies that are successful in predicting future business models often have a strong focus on innovation, one, mm -hmm. and are not afraid to try new things. So companies that are not afraid to do that, they tend to do pretty successful in the future. Now, does it mean that they always have a hit every all the time? Absolutely not. But if they're spending lots of time, then the guarantee they're paying lots of attention as it pertains to market trends, customer behavior. They're literally getting a ton of data before they release. Think about it. And Apple's headset has been talked about at nauseum for years now. They mm. should have launched years ago. Now they're getting ready to unveil the product in 2023. But yet we've been talking about this since what, 2020, 2020, 2019? So, well, actually, well, on YouTube, yeah, since then, but like be before YouTube. Before, you know. <laughs> Look, <laughs> since, yeah. since 2017, but you know, that's a whole nother other. <laughs> All right. Anyway. <laughs> All right. So, but let's look at the core, right? Mm -hmm. um, so let's look at the core and we're getting, we're getting ready to wrap it up. So, you know, we're pretty much at the, at the finish line. Yeah. So when discovering a core business model, you create value, you deliver value, you capture value. How do you do that? Make sure you have a strong value proposition. 
Make sure you're focused on specific customer segments. Make sure that your revenue, your revenue streams are tight. And in order to make sure that your revenue streams are tight, you must have a solid cost structure in which that it's, and we typically call it either, you know, foot in the door or door to the face mentality. Mm -hmm. So foot in the door, it means that essentially that you came in at a price point that is somewhat reasonable. And, as, and then on top of that, somebody's willing to chew on or willing to bite and say, okay, hey, I'll take this. A door to the face means that essentially that, look, you weren't paying attention. And nine times out of ten, nine, out of ten, nine times out of 10 companies that don't do it well and they get a door to the face by their consumers is where they didn't really pay attention. They mm -hmm. didn't structure it. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't read the room. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't study the, they didn't listen to the assignment. Yeah. Um, so then we look at it as it pertains to what it, like they have, they make sure that they have strong key resources. They make sure that they, if they realize like they're not prideful. So if they need key partners, they make those partnerships. Hence the reason why you see GM struggling right now within the EV space, because they just dropped LG, which, it, which means that they have to go with another potential teaming partner as a partnership for its battery technology for lithium to literally supply for their, for their EV vehicles. That's a problem. Notice how Tesla has been in this good old relationship with Panasonic. And from what I'm hearing, that relationship is solid. It ain't going nowhere, no shape, form or fashion anytime fast. Mm. All right. And then, of course, key activities, making sure that you have strong activities that literally keep your market engaged. Now, what are the benefits? You either have strong strengths or those weaknesses will definitely start to show or you're optimizing for those weaknesses to ultimately make yourself stronger. And you're not getting complacent on those strengths. What you're doing is you're building upon them to make yourself even stronger. Uh, like I said, stickiness. Would you rather be would you rather be, let's say, uh, would you rather be simple masking tape? Or would you rather be super glue or duct tape? All right. Um, and then on top, and then on top of that, the core, the core benefit to that is again you have a future, like because of the fact that you understand the direction, and the consumers understand your your customers know it, and then they when they buy in, then that's what ultimately makes the the company even stronger. Which leads me to my final slide, Jolene. Can you? Believe All right. That? The MVP is always the core business. Let me repeat that for you. The MVP is the core business. So I'm going to come on screen for this one. Mm -hmm. So when we think about it, actually, let's let's let that sit up there for a, for a second, just to celebrate blackness. All right, all right. So <laughs> when we think about it, when you start off as a small company, and when we look at all big businesses, all big businesses started small. But if you look at all those big businesses they still remain core to their MVP. It's just that the MVP was minimal viable because of the fact that that's the resources that they had. But as they got bigger and as they got better, what did they do? They built upon that. They built upon that to make that MVP no longer minimal viable, but to ultimately make it like the core part of the business. It's kind of like Iron Man, right? You know, if you ever watch an Iron Man movie, you see that he was able to build the suit by having this core reactor that ultimately powered the suit. And if you notice across all Iron Man, like, you know, all Iron Man movies, essentially it was always powered by that core. So the core was the MVP, which later turned into the actual core business. When you look at Apple, they focused on specific products. They focused on their products and ultimately making sure that essentially that the brand, the brand and the customer satisfaction was top notch. That was their MVP from day one making things that were beautiful. And to this day, it still is, it still remains. And that's the reason why their ecosystem remains so sticky. And when we think about it, like how does a business go from zero to a billion? It's exactly by that. It starts off by one MVP that literally just keeps getting better and better and better over iteration. And then essentially you keep adding more and keep investing more into it. And then essentially understanding that as things change, it's okay to also make iterations towards the product or the service. And that's ultimately, that's, that's literally the name of this game when we think about business models. Yo, y'all, thank you so much for watching. You know, it was so amazing to like literally, you know, grace the stage with you this evening, JoLynn, and be able to share something that is pretty much very much the core than at what we do at FTC and many of the other ventures in which that I've had the privilege, and I'm probably sure that you had the privilege of being a part of, which is the business model. Without a business model, there is no pulse. You know what would be good, Mark? Is also to take 
that concept of the core business and MVP and um, starting with an MVP and then adding on once you get really good at that one thing, like to yep. our own personal development as it relates to being an investor, you know, yep. building on that yeah. perspective. It's like a lot of times we like to always think about like, you know, and a lot of entrepreneurs make this mistake. And a lot of professionals make this mistake and hell, even investors make this mistake. And I'll break it down for everybody really quickly. Entrepreneurs make this mistake because of the fact that they think about the Googles, the Amazons of the world where they have so many things that surround their business, but they still have a core that they still have a core MVP or core business model that literally makes them who they are. Mm -hmm. Like that's, I mean, that's, that's fundamental. Now, of course they could provide other services that surround that core business, but they still will never deviate from that core business. When we think about professionals in their career, like if you think about it, if you studied up right to be a doctor, would you literally go try to like apply for jobs to be a lawyer? <laughs> well, you wouldn't be able to. You would have to go back to school. My point. Um, so, again, like that's where I say, like, remain core. When we think about investors, mm -hmm. like, you know, for example, if you studied up for Apple, why would you go invest in, say, for example, if you if you bought if you bought Apple or if you were invested into Apple, why would you go invest in Boeing when you know nothing about Boeing? You don't even understand its business model. Mm -hmm. So again, whatever is core to you, like that's why they say. And you know, I should have kept it on there to honor you know brother uh, LeBron James tonight. Keep the main thing the main thing. But you know, until next time, thank you guys for for rocking with us this evening. Yeah. I hope I drop fire tonight. If I did, go ahead and throw the fire emojis in the room. You know, go ahead, kiss the kids good night. You know, because ultimately we did oh. the very best that we could. We <laughs> dropped Jericho missiles from the sky to ultimately like make make sure that it was just nothing but knowledge bombs for everybody. So if we did that, if we hit, if, if we earn that like, go ahead and smash it. If you want to subscribe now, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. If you want to be in the know for when the next episode comes, hit that bell. But until next time, I'm Mark Monroe. I'm Jalen GC in the place to be. And this was Executive Education. We'll see you in the next one. Peace out, y'all.